The land of justice is a region that has always made me wonder. How far can technology advance, or how far will its achievements reach until Celestia turns it into an unknown civilization in the future? But that's just because I think that Celestia is keeping tabs on a certain universe's movements to keep a certain impending doom from impacting Teyvat as we know it. But that's beside the point. This video is going to focus on Fontaine's inspirations, what possible countries it might be based on, and what Fontaine's architecture, citizens, beliefs, and culture would be like. Real-life countries, both current and from the pages of history, as well as a small mix of speculation regarding what might happen within Fontaine's story, based on different aspects of their possible real-life inspirations. The first thing that comes into your mind when you see the twins Linny and Lynette in the cinematic travail trailer could be the words Victorian, 18th century, Renaissance, Industrial Age, Bioshock-esque, and of course, France. The word Fontaine itself literally means fountain in French. And there is actually a place in Fontaine called Fontaine Blue. Hopefully I didn't butcher that, which is also included in this video. So it's not wild to assume that it's inspired by France. Names, however, can only go as far in terms of what a region is inspired from. France itself isn't really known for water, but other countries around it have a better grasp of the water aspect that Fontaine is about. But I won't discount the fact that Fontaine and France, as well as Fontaine Blue, has a lot of possible theories that can be sparked within its chateaus and palaces. So, I think that Fontaine might be inspired by the industrial and renaissance age of both France and Italy, as well as the UK and the United States, specifically within the 18th century. It's funny because the 18th century is also known as the Age of Enlightenment. A bit of mind jog for you to start with for now. All of this is just a wild guess with some pointing out proofs, and mainly because I like talking about histories and architecture of different countries. But first, let's start with the Industrial Revolution and the Renaissance era. Their similarities and differences, as well as how they affect and change the shape of our world today. The term Industrial Revolution and Renaissance includes a very broad spectrum of different names and timeframes throughout history, as well as countries with their own form of 18th century styles. Both these eras had a huge impact on culture, politics, economics, and society, as well as lasting for quite a long time. And all the historical events in these two ages are similarly uncanny to everything that's happened in Fontaine that we know of. Now, I want you to think of Fontaine as I describe the events and differences of these two ages. Ready? Okay. The Industrial Revolution's main focus was on improving efficiency, making more money, and improving lives more economically. Marvels like the airship and the aeroplane, cameras, steam engines, and coke-fueled furnaces, which are blast furnaces that liquidize metals using a geological stone called coke, and not the Coca-Cola coke, were all invented in the industrial age. These are just a few examples that help speed up production, material creation, and efficiency of the different industries within that period. Productivity and economic improvements made life better, but it also created many social issues including tedious long work hours, child labor, unemployment, increased debt, and consumerism. In contrast, the Renaissance era focused mainly on new thinking and creativity. People started questioning religion and broke away from the Catholic Church and formed the Protestant churches as a result. Please tell me in the comments if that's wrong. Also, the printing press was invented in the Renaissance. Freedom of writing allowed individuals to express themselves as well as impart their knowledge to the rest of the world. Books could finally be published so that the common people could read and think for themselves, which in turn sparked the different minds and values of people all across the world as time went on. The values and beliefs that were included were humanism, individualism, skepticism, well-roundedness, secularism, and finally classicism. All these different values you can spot in the astrologist Mona, who I know isn't from Fontaine, but displays many of the mannerisms and characteristics 
of what Fontaine's and PC's exhibit as a whole. Mona places her importance in astrology and herself as an astrologer, symbolizing humanism. Her sense of self-ideals and being herself shows her individualistic value. Her skepticism also shows a lot from her career as both an astrologist and a writer for the Steambird, as well as how she presents and takes in different opinions. Her well-roundedness allows her to be interested in many aspects of her journey and take on any opportunities as they come. The aspect of secularism is also present in Mona, as she focuses on things like traveling, progressing her career, and making money for her comfortable needs, more or less. All these aspects reflect what's known as classicism, which embraces being open to new things and allows one to be unique in their own way without being bound too much to religion and faith, which is also reflected on Mona in her vision story. Being more practical and open to what the world has to offer than letting the gods lead her path. And in turn, the Renaissance mindset, as I like to call it, were also reflected in buildings, writing, painting, and sculptures, as well as science and every aspect of their lives. If the printing press was the only thing that stood out to you, then that's okay too. But if you haven't already noticed, the different aspects of the industrial age's focus on efficiency and improvement, as well as the Renaissance era's expanded values and beliefs in the real world, are already reflected on Fontaine's people. And not just their people, but the values and mindsets of their culture can be seen in people who aren't from Fontaine as well. Which means that the globalization of Fontaine's rapid growth is already underway. It won't be long until all of Tevet is affected and woken up by the Age of Enlightenment. Now that we're done getting to know the words Industrial Revolution and Renaissance, it's time to see how those two eras in history are going to shape Fontaine's architecture. And we'll be looking at four countries in the continent of Europe that I think are closest to Fontaine's aesthetic. Do tell me if I missed a country because my eyes are like that of a goldfish. So these four are the United Kingdom, France, Italy, and the United States. Oh, oh, wait a minute, hold on, hold on. These four countries, of course, are all set in the 18th century industrial era up until the Renaissance era. You can think of movies like Noir or Sherlock Holmes if you can't visualize what the UK and the United States would look like in the 18th century. On to Fontaine's architecture, the key difference between the industrial era and renaissance era's architectures is that they both look entirely different from each other. Starting with the industrial era, it's a very steel and metal focused style, as well as most of its characteristics being solely built for efficiency. There was no sense of making things pretty and fancy because you want it to be efficient in every way possible. You could think of factories, power plants, and fabrications as the bread and butter structures of the industrial era. Large, tall residential buildings with multiple tenants within, towering broadcast stations with roads and pathways littered with newspapers, and the busy and tirelessly working class scurrying about on the streets. I'd say there is little space for leisure in the industrial areas of Fontaine. But when there is a time and a place, you'll be sure to find it in very short notice. Imagine the traveler making their way through the crowds of the city plaza, being handed pamphlets and discount coupons, walking past smoke belching factories and finding your way through alleyways selling whatever automatons and steampunk items, only to find a pair of twins on a small open street on top of a stage performing. Tricks, flips, twirls, and dances of joy that barely reflect the image of Fontaine's outer region. You meet these twins before they are pursued by the authorities for loitering and possible vandalization. You run away from the city guard and learn their names, Linny and Lynette. And so the tale unfolds as you take your first steps into Fontaine's story quest. If we look into other games' perspective and place it into Fontaine, the steampunk-esque look of the lower class structures and ghetto-like feel of the outer regions of Fontaine might have the industrial region and steampunk design. Think of the slightly rundown areas in the Dishonored series or the factories from Bioshock Infinite. Remember the Vox Populi? Yeah, there might be a bit of that as well. 
messy narrow corners, large overcrowded squares and plazas, and a weird sense of poverty no matter where you go. You might start asking, Aru, what about the fancy looking areas of Fontaine? Isn't Fontaine filled with inventions and technological advancements? Well, to me, as steampunk games go, you can only see the heights of technology at the heart and above its poverty-stricken foundations. While the outer regions of Fontaine might look like a mess of put-together bars of steel and metal sheets for walls, you might find the more bourgeois people of Fontaine living within a so-called higher-class district. I like to imagine this sort of polarizing set of areas that differentiate the working and lower class living on somewhat decent but still impoverished living conditions from the high-class politics and aristocrats that live in fancy towers and well-guarded sections of Fontaine. In the steampunk-esque areas, you would see not only open fields with factories working overtime, but lakes and rivers are now connected by steel bridges reminiscent of the Hell's Gate Bridge or the Eads Bridge. So where steam-powered vehicles and ships can be seen crossing these metal bridges and rivers, on the other side, you would see residential districts filled with apartments and tall condos for the working class. You could think of buildings like the Flatiron in New York or the Chicago Insurance Building. Games like the Fallout series and Bioshock Infinite's residential areas would have design similarities in that aspect, heavily characterizing the focus on efficiency and ease of use that the Industrial Revolution aims to achieve. You would also see buildings like these in the commercial district, but this is where structures become less functional and more aesthetic and grandiose. Structures like the Palace Opera or Palais Garnier from Paris or the Crystal Palace from London might be seen and inspired from to mirror the Renaissance style of Fontaine. The revival of Greek and Roman art becomes more apparent as you go further into the commercial districts. Right before you enter the higher class district, you would find, theoretically, the Eiffel Tower in all its steel and metal glory towering above an open field where people from all classes dwell. Finally, where all the steampunk-esque and industrial era's design comes to a close and renaissance structures start to emerge. The higher district, where the aristocrats and politicians dwell, a largely Italy and France-inspired area. The higher district, I theorize, would have a mix of both Rome and Venice, Italy's capital and a certain part of Italy known for water. Places inspired from the Sistine Chapel, which is famous for its Renaissance paintings by Michelangelo, or the Palazzo Vecchio, symbolizing the cradle of Italian Renaissance era, and slowly moving closer into the water-filled area of Venice inspirations. The city of water, La Dominante, La Serissima, the floating city, and the city of masks. These are all different names that Venice is known for. Here I'd wager there is an inner region or a place where only the top of the top class dwell, and where these top-of-the-line citizens live in may have the extravagant renaissance designed structures that you come to think of. Floating buildings like the ones you see in Bioshock, skyscrapers as far as the eye can see, interior designs that make you forget the hardships that those who live below you experience. Places like the Biblioteca Marciana, a key example of Venetian Renaissance, or the Basilica di San Marco, which is one of the top attractions of Italy, with its marvelous decor and gold mosaics, as well as works by Renaissance painters and Byzantine domes. Or the Piazza San Marco, which is the most crowded public square in Venice. And one of my favorites, the Teatro La Fenice one of the most famous tourist spots in Venice. Although destroyed by fire three times, it was always rebuilt to its original glory. I theorized that the twins Lenny and Lynette would also have a bit of screen time performing in this theater as well. And of course, let's not forget the Grand Canal, famous worldwide for the centuries-old palaces which stand on both sides of the water. Many of the magnificent buildings show the wealth of Venetian families and possibly reflecting the wealth of Fontaine as well. Finally, we tread into the heart of Fontaine's higher district and find more of France's Renaissance structures, with the aristocrats living in various chateaus 
from real-life inspirations in France. And the most prominent of these chateaux, and possibly would be the Hydro Archon's residence, is the Chateau de Fontainebleau. Historically, it is one of the largest of the French chateaux and is the favorite residence of the kings of France. So it might not be wild to assume that the Hydro Archon would reside here as well. In the current year 2022, Chateau de Fontainebleau is a national museum for its unique architecture and historical importance. Tangent. Another chateau that might interest you is the Chateau d'Annette, which once housed the Fountain of Diana and the sculpture of the nymph of Fontainebleau. The goddess of Diana was said to have lived in the forest near the town of Nemi, and the town of Nemi also has a lake known as the Mirror of Diana. The reason why I'm trying to discuss this is that the Hydro Archon might take on inspirations from Diana, the goddess of hunting. See, Diana has multiple names and aliases, which I think fit the theme of masquerades in Fontaine. One of the names is the Triple Goddess, which is an aspect of Diana the Moon, Diana the Huntress, and Diana of the Underworld. Triketra and Moon Sister theories beware, it's a head roll and a half. Another title is the Goddess of Crossroads and the Underworlds, which also speak of Diana's triple way guardianship over the crossroads and the underworld as well. And finally, the Frame God, which tells of Diana falling into a subset of celestial gods called Frame Gods. But the difference being Diana did not become a god without a purpose or an idol god, known as De Otiosi. A bit of Celestia theory there too, since Celestia doesn't really do much compared to Archons who take care of humanity, other than of course New King Civilizations. The Hydro Archon herself judges the gods but knows to be cautious while doing so, which might reflect Diana's role as the Frame God. But this is all theory based on inspirations that the Hydro Archon might come from. These statues and sculptures are a big part of the chateaux and Renaissance era styles of France, Italy, and English Renaissance styles and would possibly be very reflective on Fontaine's story and design. Which is why I had to take this side tangent real quick. Now then, as we venture forth into the center of the higher district of Fontaine, let's say we meet the militia or the royal guards. We are then taken to speak with the Hydro Archon in the Chateau of Fontainebleau. It takes you back to the Thousand Armed God that the Shogun once created in Inazuma. But this one didn't have an unsettling feeling, rather an endearing one. Yet you also feel as though you should keep your guard up as you walk through hallway upon hallway of statues, fountains, and sculptures you finally reach a wall with a rather large door. The door opens and the Hydro Archon sits on her throne. You notice by the way she looks that she is already measuring your worth. You approach her, wondering how such a place with both poverty and luxury exists. You look at her and she smirks at you with disdain. As the goddess of justice would judge other gods, so would she also judge someone not from this world. She smiles at you with contempt and leads you to a wide balcony where the entirety of Fontaine can be seen. She starts asking you the same question but words it in a way that intrigues and disturbs you. How do you think such a place of luxury can exist without expecting to pay something in return? She then asks a different question. How can those who are above us the divine beings, create such a land with powerful gods that watch over it, yet destroy civilizations as they please. You continue to find out more about Fontaine's situation. And so, the Archon quest continues. Remember, it's not steampunk if it's not a dystopian world. And it's not a Hoyoverse plot if it's not twisted in some way. You can argue that a steampunk world can be perfect, but how much effort and labor do you think maintaining such a high class region would cost? It's not all sunshine and rainbows like the stories talk about, of course. There is always a catch. And in the land of justice, is it really justice or is it just us? A land of constant masquerades of celebration and deception. A gathering for those who wear fabricated masks, draped in their fantastic costumes, and lathered in luxuries one can only dream of. And the guilty who hide behind such masks can only rely on those such cruelties to fuel their own twisted egos and values. Amidst the droves of masquerading dances, you might want to be careful who you listen to and tell your stories. Such places with prim and proper mannered aristocrats 
can only serve as a circus for the selfish and warped minds. And there you have it, the inspirations of which Fontaine could be based on and some possible plot lines to how the story of Fontaine's Archon Quest will unfold. I didn't want to go into too much detail in regards to the structures because industrial and renaissance architecture, as well as architecture in general, takes a really long time to discuss. And especially if you're going to put in theories based on a game's region that hasn't even been released yet. But that all pretty much sums up how Fontaine is going to turn out and how the different citizens of Fontaine are going to be. Taking inspirations from steampunk games and post-apocalyptic dystopian fantasy games, I think Fontaine is going to be one heck of a roller coaster ride. Of course, if you enjoyed this video, click on the like button as well as comment what you think down below especially about how Fontaine is going to look like and subscribe if you want to see more of my content. That's gonna be it for this video so I'll see you guys in the next one. Yeah, bye!